An ancient scribe, in an era romantic, once referred to innocence as ignorance. It was a statement to provoke, one has no doubt, as to do so aligns what is a concept steeped in ideas of purity with what is essentially sin. At its most generous, innocence is a state of childlike naivety insulated from the pain of reality within a bubble of youthful obliviousness. It is considered temporary, a fleeting thing that will one day perish. It is the absence of experience, for with experience comes awful realization. The age of darkness was ushered in by experiences the tore humankind's collective psyche open, and from without poured within the seething horror of the universe as it truly is. The revelation of the War Master's treachery, and worse, his chaotic patrons, fundamentally upended the rational reality of so many, laying bare truths best undiscovered engraving upon the universe a new status quo none wished for. Again and again in the heresy's early years this pattern was repeated, myriad tragedies cut from the same cloth, yet each devastating in their own hideous ways. This is a record of one such tragedy. Know then, that this is the night that brought doom to the red planet, the sundering of the sacred realm of the priests of the machines, a record of the schism of Mars. Despite dwelling ostensibly, and in most imperial-centric histories, in Terra's shadow, the domains of Red Mars were once just as numerous, prosperous, and populous as the human homeworlds. Isolated from the rest of humanity during the long dark of the Age of Strife, the Forge Worlds, owing fealty to the Red Planet, were forced to fend for themselves in the deep terror of old night. Resisting the depredations of predatory Xenos races and ethereal onslaughts from warp creatures. Those that flourished often did so due to their abilities to defend themselves, and once the expeditionary fleets of the Emperor's Great Crusade reached their stellar shores, those bellicose kingdoms found themselves subsumed into the great mechanized apparatus that was the Mechanicum. While Terra had its War Council, and the diverse other governing bodies of the Imperium that spread outwards beyond this, it remained a wholly secular military dictatorship under the beneficent gaze of the Emperor of Mankind. The Mechanicum was altogether different, a holy order, a technocracy, a fusion of church and state and industry. Although the Martian Fabricator General ostensibly held a seat at the Emperor's side, Mars was given control of the totality of its domains within the borders of the Imperium. It was a symbiotic relationship. While the worlds of the Imperium were under the direct governance of Terra, the many forge worlds of the Mechanicum were more disparate, independent polities that owed a sort of feudal loyalty to the lords of the Red Planet. The degree of lordship Mars could exercise varied vastly. Some planets were bound by absolute writ, satrapies to the seat of the Fabricator General themselves, while with others the bonds of fealty were weaker. Rivalries and disagreements, scientific, theological, and otherwise, stretched the definitions of the word loyalty as far as they would go. This was in a very real sense 
a product of both Mars's nominally weaker political and military power compared to that of Terra and its Astartes legions, but also a facet of the Mechanicum's very foundation. The regime that had united the Red Planet during the horrid millennia of the Age of Strife had been a grassroots, or rather, dust roots, political and religious movement during its inception. The first tech priests were holy men, binding the roving clans of Mars together in veneration of the machine god, uniting scattered domains to fend off the ravages of techno-barbarian hordes, berserk thinking machines, and ravenous psi carnivora. Deals, treaties, and alliances were all the stock in trade of the Mechanicum, from its very inception. The resources of the Red Planet were scarce, and it was always deemed by the eminently practical Mechanicum more favorable to simply bring a polity, or clan, and its resources into the fold, with a peaceful, or at least as bloodless as possible, means. Whereas the Emperor upon Terra had launched his unification wars from the barrels of the first bolters, the Mechanicum had largely united Mars under their sway through means altogether more subtle. This persisted for their entire history, right up until the union of Terra and Mars and beyond within the Great Crusade. The real politic approach of their system was extended to newly found forge worlds. Those lost domains of Mars, slowly being reunited with greater humanity, were negotiated with painstakingly, only to be deemed a war target in the cases of the most extreme recalcitrance, or worse, technological heresy. What this would mean in many cases was years of bargaining with forge worlds that had held fast throughout the horrors of old night only to find the red-robed emissaries of Holy Mars arriving in system with demands of fealty. A powerful forge world would be well aware of their status as a vital imperial and mechanicum asset, a jewel in the crowns of one empire or other. The reunification with the forge world of Phaeton, for example, led to a feud of reputations that almost came to open conflict, while that of thrice-cursed Xana managed to secure almost complete autonomy of not only their local spatial volume, but their technological knowledge base as well. It can be said that the Mechanicum was less of a regime and more of a shared culture, a heritage, or need an obsession, given political form by economic and religious projection. Concepts abounding within the Imperium, those of duty and fidelity to the regime, were secondary to more practical or even esoteric concerns. And so the forge polities of Holy Mars formed a feudal mirror empire to that of Terra, and a fractious one indeed. Mars, by 005 M31, was a microcosm for the Mechanicum at large. The Red Planet was restless, divided into power blocks centered on the largest of its forge complexes. Although riven with inconsistencies and lying upon a large spectrum, these power blocks were themselves divided upon one core idea, the Emperor of Mankind's place within the theology of the machine cult. Upon his coming to Mars centuries beforehand, the Emperor was heralded as the Omnissiah, the physical embodiment of the Deus Mechanicus, the two united by the third aspect of the Trinity, the motive force that gives life to all technology. The coming of the machine god's earthly avatar had been a profound religious revelation for the Mechanicum, with many leadership within the priesthood declaring the Emperor's place within their religion as formal dogma a declaration that the Emperor himself was keenly willing to leverage and embrace, despite his banning of religion throughout his Imperium. That being said, many within the priesthood of Mars demurred on the official line the Synod, and publicly the Fabricator General, had taken, 
believing the emperor to be a false prophet, whose powers, though impressive, were fundamentally based in rational science, if that ill understood at this point in history. While this ideological divide was initially a point of heated, but essentially theoretical debate, by the second century of the Great Crusade, the doubts of this faction of the Mechanicum had metastasized into resentment and bitterness, the unique stylings of a hatred born of faith and curdled by politics. The Emperor had, to these non-believers, knowingly and malevolently seized the earnestly held beliefs of Mars and her empire for his own ends, yoking the Mechanicum to his Imperium under the auspices of partnership and kindred, but in reality transforming the priesthood into an arms manufacturer and nothing else. At the forefront of this discontent was the Fabricator General himself, Kelbor Hal. Atop Olympus Mons, the tallest mountain in the solar system, Kelbor Hal ruled a forge fane that, befitting his title, outstripped every one of his contemporaries and subordinates in industrial capacity, output, and technological advancement. At some 80% mechanical, the Fabricator General made the slow extermination of his biological body a point of significant pride. It was, for him, according to accounts inscribed by his closest aides, a refutation of the painfully human baseline form of the Terran Emperor. Kelbor Hal had been the Fabricator General ruling the Mechanicum at the time of the Emperor's arrival, when a knight suit of House Tyrannus had been miraculously healed by the Emperor before the assembled masses. Despite his misgivings, the Archmagos had known full well the dogmatic and political position such a miraculous act placed him in. The terms negotiated formed the Treaty of Olympus, an accord between two ostensibly sovereign powers in partnership, but which Kelbor Hal continued to hold, albeit quite privately, as a chain around the neck of his Mechanicum, binding the Empire of Mars to Terra as nothing better than a satrapy. This belief was not precisely uncommon, but it was a politically and religiously dangerous one to be public with. The official dogma of the Synod of Mars placed the Emperor within the divinity of the cult Mechanicus, and a great many of the Mechanicum's magi, from the lowliest to the greatest, earnestly believed in their Omnissiah. Enough, indeed, to make unbelief untenable at best and dangerous at worst, for a prosecution for tech heresy was far from unheard of. In many ways, the unbelievers of Mars formed a curious negative image to the believers of the Imperium, where the Imperial truth had driven those who declared the Emperor divine underground. As has been mentioned, the Mechanicum itself was far less centralized around one authority than the Imperium, denying Kelbor Hal the ability to act on his beliefs and his resentments for centuries. This, of course, did not stop the Fabricator General from seeking out like-minded Archmagi around whom he could build a political and industrial power block. Kelbor Hal counted as his closest allies the Archmagi Erzi Malevolus and Lucas Chrome, the latter a master of the forges of Mondus Gamma and Mars's foremost expert in the creation of automata and the slaved intelligences of the Silica Anima, as well as a dozens of other associated and subordinate forges and tagma. To this cabal was dispatched Regulus, the Mechanicum emissary to the war master Horus Lupercal, turned from his role as the Synod's voice in Lupercal's councils to Horus's own agent to the Fabricator General. Horus's ambitions at this point in history had already turned towards diabolical treachery. The War Master now bent his phenomenal mind and resources to the securing of allies in his upcoming rebellion. Horus knew well of Kelbor Hal's disquiet and his resentments, 
and well perceived all that prevented the Fabricator General from acting upon them. The situation was eminently exploitable, but it was plainly obvious that Kelbor Hal would regard him, the War Master, with the same degree of suspicion that he leveled towards all Imperials. In the end, the Fabricator General cared nothing for those born of Terra and her colonies. His loyalty was only ever to Sacred Mars. Horus, to Kelbor Hal, would be just another Terran seeking to chain the Mechanicum to his schemes. The War Master ensured that Regulus's opening entreaties to Kelbor Hal and his Cabal was a message that spoke of true partnership, not subservience. He carefully highlighted the War Master's empathy towards Mars's plight, betrayed as he, the War Master, had similarly been by the Emperor's empty promises. Kinship was courted, yes, but the War Master also presented the Fabricator General, through Regulus, with a truly kingly gift. During a recent compliance operation against a wayward human regime known as the Orishian Technocracy, the Sons of Horus had encountered troops equipped with technology hitherto unseen by the Imperium. The Technocracy were bearers of not one, but two previously undiscovered standard template construct patterns, one for an unknown mark of Astarte's battle plate, and another for the production of lightweight solar generators capable of supplying the power needs of an Epsilon V pattern forge complex. STC devices, relics of the Dark Age of technology that granted undreamt of stellar expansion to mankind in millennia past, were, and yet remain, artifacts of worth beyond words for the priesthood of Mars. The Red Planet has fought genocidal wars on the mere rumors of their existence, and here, to Kelbor Hal, Horus, in a show of good faith, presented two wholly new schema. The move was both practical and symbolic. On the one hand, the sheer value of the gift itself was beyond numbers or words to accurately capture. On the other, it was a pointed reminder of all the Emperor had done to slave the Mechanicum to his goals and to stymie the sacred quest for knowledge. Prior to the Master of Mankind's unification of Terra under his rule, the Mechanicum, having united Mars centuries prior, had routinely dispatched exploratory missions to humanity's birth world. These targeted strikes had aimed to extract what the Mechanicum deemed sacred and holy technology from unclean Terran rebels, the disparate and constantly warring collections of techno-barbarian warlords, genocide popes, and sorcerous demagogues that ruled whatever remained of old Earth. By both sacred dogma and academic drive, the priests of Mars plundered the technological wealth of the forgotten realms of the homeworld, conducting lightning raids on fortifications of its worst despots, such that the sacred devices of humanity's past not be lost to blinkered ignorance and wanton devastation. The Emperor's unification came with the seizure of countless technological secrets, a great many of which the Lord of Lightning placed under strict regulation by certain organizations within his new Imperium, or banned outright, forever sealing their use and research beyond the bounds of any soul yet living, unless he said so. Kelbor Hal and his contemporaries believed the Emperor's ban of Mechanicum Explorators from Terra and his denial of their rights to research and iterate upon technology he alone deemed forbidden were impossible demands upon the Mechanicum within the bounds of the Treaty of Olympus. The peace of the Master of Mankind was an illusion, designed to strip Mars of her freedoms and her sacred duties. The STC templates, freely given now by Horus, was the first step in a promise of the War Master. In Horus's new Imperium, the Mechanicum would have no such restrictions. 
No longer would a Terran upstar dictate to the Red Planet what it could or could not bend its efforts towards. But the templates were but a first step. The second, promised Regulus, was the unsealing of the vaults of Moravec. Moravec had been a Terran savant born at an undetermined point in the Age of Strife, during the worst of that era's conflicts that had turned Terra into a blasted, radiation-choked wasteland. A believer in the power of technology and science to uplift the species from its present hell, Moravec did not simply wish to rekindle the achievements of the Dark Age of Technology, but to supersede them. He wished to pioneer science in such a way that delivered unto humanity the singularity, a creation of an intelligence greater than human that would allow mankind to transcend its earthly nightmares and ascend to a higher plane of existence. Details on precisely what research Moravec conducted upon Terra to this end are either lost forever or sealed beyond all hope of your humble servant's access. But what is known is that a warlord by the name of Khazar united the warring tribes of the Pan-Pacifican Dust Bowl to storm the citadel Moravec had made his own. Such was the terror of the techno-sorcery of his workings that it led to the formation of the Pan-Pacific Empire under Khazar, far before the rise of Northan Doom, one of the most infamous despots of the Unification Wars. Moravec, deposed from his stronghold, fled Terra from Mars, seeking amongst its tech priests kindred minds. On Mars's soil, he founded the Brotherhood of Singularitarianism, setting up a base of operations in the tunnels kilometers below Olympus Mons, the seat of the current Fabricator General. At some undetermined point, the adept Moravec died or disappeared, and the Brotherhood he had founded lapsed into obscurity. His work, however, remained sealed within its vaults, with rumors of dark tidings and sinister machinations surrounding them. Upon the Emperor's arrival on Mars, and his revelation as the Omnissiah, he had immediately sought these vaults personally, sealing them by explicit order at the head of a formation of the Legio Custodes. Technically, the very location of the vaults had been ordered purged from all data archives on Mars, but it should perhaps come as no surprise that Kelbor Hal personally retained this knowledge. Regulus, through malefic tidings granted to him by the dark packs of his liege, was in possession of a means to open the vault at Kelbor Hal's behest. By what accounts survive, the ambassador of the War Master utilized the opportunity provided to inform the Fabricator General of Moravec's being branded a witch. In corroborating studies, it would appear the adept had, in his pursuit of the singularity, not only researched the purely scientific aspects of abominable intelligence, but the means by which human technology and artificial minds may be brought into fusion with the raw powers of the warp. Regulus asserted that such research made him dangerous to the Emperor and his plans, for it was well known amongst the Synod of Mars that research into abominable intelligence had been strictly outlawed by a Terran decree co-signed by the dogma of Mars' own religion. To fuse technology with warpcraft, such a thing was only a whisper of a rumor. Shades of old night left to haunt the dreams of the truly mad. Regulus asserted that in his studies, Moravec made contact with and conducted pacts amongst entities from the Immaterium, although of what order of standing, history cannot assert. The Fabricator General's knowledge of the true nature of the warp and the intelligences within it are open to historical debate. Given the degree of learnings Kelbor Hal possessed on esoteric technologica, and the breadth of his scientific understandings, it is perhaps safe to assume that the Fabricator General was in some part aware that the prevailing insistence of the Imperial Truth, 
that entities encountered in real space warp space intersection events were simply hyper predatory xenos of unknown origins was far from fulsome reality to one's mind however it would appear that as was so often the case in the terrible years of the age of darkness the sheer depths of the immaterium's horror were not even remotely comprehended by Kelbor Hal. The warp to the Fabricator General was an ill-understood but phenomenally powerful dimension of pure energy. Moravec, according to Regulus, had utilized it to fuse scientific and etheric concepts to bring into being devices unbound by the laws of nature and physics, a truly new frontier in human scientific advancement. The Fabricator General, perched upon the precipice of a revelation in knowledges that the Terran despot had forbidden, accepted. He took the War Master's terms and inloaded the data required to open the vault. In doing so, Kelbor Hal brought unto the Martian realm the unholy taint of scrap code. Scrap code, known laterally by its high Gothic term lingua diabolis, is a form of technological virus capable of infecting, commandeering, and corrupting almost any form of machinery and technology. In its most basic form, the code is essentially mundane. It is junk data, digital detritus, accrued by the simple processing of cogitators. Mechanicum, prior to the outbreak of the heresy, was familiar with it, ensuring to keep all networked cogitator engines from accruing only a certain amount of this data and maintaining strict thresholds of just how much this codified white noise could persist within any given system before purgation. What the vaults of Moravec contained, what Kelbor Hal unleashed, was a wholly different thing. So devastatingly virulent, it wholly supplanted the term scrap code in the minds of the priests of Mars. Scrap code is indeed junk data, but suffused with the rawest energies of primordial annihilation. It is digital chaos. Scholars of the esoteric and the damned have oft likened it to the dark tongue of the emanations beholden to one or other god of the dark pantheon. Seemingly utter ruined nonsense stuff, it yet possesses the power to unmake the logical and corrupt the pure. Akin to any virus, it infects, pervading systems and machines alike until the device, the network, the mind, has wholly fallen to the grip of the primordial annihilator. Kelbor Hal possessed the dubious honor of becoming the first vessel for Moravec scrap code, and from him an unholy tide burst into the Martian data networks. Olympus Mons, the Fabricator General's personal domain, was first, its mighty floodstream network shunting scrap code into every conduit, wire, cable, feed, and haptic implant in the forge, burrowing, scratching, eroding, corrupting. Mars was a wholly connected world, as befitted the regime that had been its guardian for millennia. Along trillions of kilometers of mundane cabling, through electrical feed clouds, fiber optics, hololithic conduits, data cascaded around the red planet. Many of these systems, of course, predated the priests attended to them. Artifacts of the Dark Age of Technology, whose capabilities were barely understood and whose provenance was wholly lost. Almost all of the countless means of information transfer were susceptible to the taint of scrap code that now flooded forth from Olympus Mons. In the dead of Martian night, the infection dove onwards, alive yet unalive, intelligent yet running on base instinct, a torrent of burbling, chaotic, undata drawn to the pure and holy binary of the Mechanicum. 
if you may forgive the poetic turn of phrase, scrap code sought to supplant the one and the zero. It inserted a number between them. It broke the core foundations of Principia Mathematica. Unmaker disease, torching the threads of the rational scientific universe. It twisted the sacred geometries, warping gracefully conducted code streams into debased tidal deluges of wicked insanity. Wholly malformed, this code fell to the howling depths of the scrap code, itself becoming predatory and deranged, a virus loose along the wires. The information systems of the Mechanicum were not wholly without defenses. Informational Aegis barriers and Castellan data gin were routinely employed to prevent wholly mundane and natural instances of scrap code from damaging cogitator networks. But against the hateful thing that emerged from the vaults, they were naught but chaff before a hurricane. At the speed of machine thought, the scrap code spread across Mars, worming into forged domains through a hundred different routes, probing, shattering, and overwhelming as it went. Aegis barriers shattered in minutes. Data gin were consumed by the millions. The sheer savagery of the scrap code was unstoppable in its hunger and malevolence. A scant few Archmagi, canny enough to grasp that what was occurring was wholly different to an ordinary but serious code virus outbreak, moved rapidly to sunder their forges from the greater Martian network. But so thoroughly connected was the Red Planet that even these few could not escape the onrushing catastrophe. The scrap code was so wickedly fast, so perniciously fecund, so inventively malignant, that it found the weak point of nearly every single forge. And once it had, it began to induce apocalyptic systems failures. Mars began to die. Scrap code, one must be clear, is not merely corruptive. It is not only a thing that infects to propagate. One almost wishes this were the case. No, scrap code seeks to annihilate. And it brought this to the Red Planet in a single night of pure ruin. The great Schiaparelli repository, raised above the Acadalia Planitia, was a mighty pyramidal archive, containing information dating back to some of the earliest days of humanity's exploration of science. The wisdom of the ages was infected with scrap code within less than a minute. Twenty millennia's worth of knowledge, carefully itemized, catalogued, and tagged within crystalline data stacks, was rendered into burbling, screeching drivel. The knowledge of an entire species turned into the cackling of a dying cogitator. At Sinius Sebaeus, the continent-spanning assembly factorums of Exertius Imperialis and Legionius Astartes' mainline battle tanks simply ceased functioning. Machinery that had not halted production for a single second of the previous two centuries, ceasing to a halt, never to work again. This was an almost beneficent act when contrasted against the spite of the scrap code's actions at the chemical refineries of Vastatius Borealis where it overrode the command codes of the facility's pressure valves, flooding worker habitations in the northern polar basin with a mix of phosgene, methyl isocyanate, and hydrogen chloride. This creeping murder sunk into the very depths of the hives, killing every single soul as it went, reaping a tally of some 900,000 indentured serfs by the pale light of the morning. In the Tycho Brahe Ammunition Storage Facility, the scrap code issued instructions to the atmospheric control systems to raise the temperature in the Prometheum tanks, hot housing the fuel dumps until a calamitous detonation tore out the lower storage facilities. The resulting fireball continued to expand exponentially, an overwhelming inferno that consumed the entire facility with the detonation of billions of tons of ordnance previously bound for the Great Crusade. No corner of Mars 
was spared from the wrath of the rampaging code. Its gluttonous devastation seemingly stoked by every atrocity it committed. It altered the life support systems of the astropathic choir at Medusa Fosse, flooding their lungs with hydrogen cyanide and killing them within mere minutes. The etheric death scream of 6,000 psychers killed many more across the Sol system, and it is said to have been felt by sensitives as far as the Imperial Palace on Terra. With these deaths, Mars fell into a deathly silence. Across the Red Planet, the same story repeated again and again and again. Machines rebelled against their own natures, their logic engines melting down into chaotic, anti-binary slurry. Paradoxical command logs flew across tortured networks. Circuits blew out and fused. Intricate workings of barely understood machines melted into slag, irreparable and lost to the tides of history forever. Fusion reactors went critical as the scrap code gleefully overloaded their control matrices, raising great mushroom clouds into the Martian atmosphere, flash melting whole cities in surging radiological cascades. Servitors and automata, the organic brains of the former usurped and the silica anima of the latter corrupted, turned on their masters and butchered them wholesale, an uprising tinged with the species' memory of the machine wars of millennia past. The forges screamed. The binauric howling of dying adepts mixed with the flesh voice wailing of their unmodified thralls, mixed with the screeching of dying technology. It had taken mere minutes for the scrap code to be unleashed from Olympus Mons, and in those minutes, the death toll had climbed into the millions. And it would keep on climbing. The Mechanicum was dying. The priests of Red Mars, a light within their temples of technological mastery, betrayed by the usurpation of the sciences they thought explicable, now rampant in seething, boiling hatred. In the years that followed, the night that brought the downfall of the Red World would become known as the Death of Innocence. It was, in a very real, very terrible sense, only the beginning. There were long years of struggle, strife, and death upon Mars's red soil. But for those tales, your humble servant must rest a while. Ave Imperator. Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.